Almost a decade after the 2010 Deepwater Horizon disaster, there we go. hundreds of scientists are assessing the impact of the largest offshore oil spill in U.S. history. What follows are some of their stories, intimate portraits of research, innovation, and discovery. I've always been interested in science. From the earliest uh, childhood days, I can remember being interested in how things work. I lived in Massachusetts. I grew up as a child just a few meters from the beach, hiking along the ocean and studying animals that you find in the ocean, as well as having excellent teachers in a small community school, literally a four-room schoolhouse with six grades in the Cove area of Beverly, Massachusetts. And in high school, I was very interested in science, but interestingly, I was told that girls couldn't take physics and certainly shouldn't major in chemistry, which of course made me want to major in physics and chemistry all the more. And when my uh, sister married a Dutch physicist who was in the U.S. on a Fulbright, a very tall, handsome, interesting guy, Hans Fredericks, who had lots of friends who would come to the house and talk science. Now this is when I'm 15 years old, so it's a very impressionable time in one's life. Here were these very interesting people from all over the world coming to talk physics, to discuss science, and this was a time when the Cold War was still operating, and yet as physicists, they went to Moscow and talked with their Russian counterparts. So it was an international uh, observation that science was global. That was how I got interested in science. However, it didn't take long before Dr. Caldwell discovered that science wasn't an easy career path for women. The first observation that I was going to have a tough time in science as a woman was when I was in high school and I asked my chemistry teacher for a recommendation to Radcliffe, which was at that time women's component of Harvard. His reaction was, girls don't do science, I, d I can't write a recommendation for you, which was kind of irritating. So I went to my guidance counselor and she arranged for me to get some very good recommendations, but that was the beginning. And it just got more difficult when I was a graduate student. Ironically, I ended up working for a um, geneticist at the University of Washington who really did not like women students. Fortunately, a new professor arrived, a marine microbiologist, John Liston. He had no lab, no students. He was given an empty room, and I became his first student. I literally was his technician and his student, which was an incredible experience because John Liston had no prejudices about women in science. He was a fascinating, interesting man, and uh, he provided tremendous opportunities. While I was a graduate student, he was asked to give a paper in Philadelphia. He called me on the Sunday morning, the flight was that Sunday night, and said, oh, he said, I'm, I'm ill. He said, I, I just can't fly. You're gonna have to give the paper. And I went to Philadelphia and gave my first paper. I think he wasn't ill at all. He just wanted to make sure that I got to give the paper. So it depends on who you work with and who you work for as to whether your career will be a success, I think. I was lucky. I had John Liston. During Dr. Caldwell's long and distinguished career, she's been a leader, paving the way for more women to become scientists. I've been involved in a lot of studies on the issue of women in science, women in society. Very clearly, it's something I would call the necessity for the posse syndrome. That is, to be able to work in groups and not be alone. To be alone is not just disenfranchising, which of course it is, but it's also disempowering. 
Whereas if you are working together in a group of several individuals, several women together, sharing problems, sharing uh, successes, it's empowering and it allows um, the opportunity to take risk and to, to really believe in yourself. And I think that's critical. I'm very envious, for example, of my daughter, who is a physician. She has a gaggle, I guess you could say, of fellow female physicians, about a dozen of them, that went through a very special program, um, physician scholar program, at the University of Illinois. They have stayed together as a team, not working together in the same hospital, but every year they get together, share experiences, interact. Uh, they form their medical physician posse, if you will. And that allows them to overcome hurdles because they can then find some of the impositions to their progress humorous because they can share it, they can figure out ways to overcome it. And I think that is a very important aspect of success. Now I suppose that this is how men gather their capacity to be bold and, and curious and move forward because they spend most of their time um, on teams, whether it's football or basketball or whatever. And perhaps as women have been moving more into sports, this may be a mechanism again for that team building, that collaboration that seems to uh, be very important. The ability to be able to share experiences, to know that you are not alone and that what has happened to you if it's negative is not a singular event, but perhaps a continuation of what may be a societal problem that needs to be addressed and overcome. Today, the scientific community is working together to push the boundaries of what they've learned about oil spills and what still needs to be discovered. <laughs>